Welcome to the Tech Story podcast, a place where we interview founders, investors, and interesting people in tech. Today, I'm very excited to welcome Oliver Kicks from Concept Ventures. Concept Ventures are the largest pre-seed fund in the UK. Oliver was their first employee and now uh, principal. So Oliver, thank you for taking the time for being with us. Uh, would you like to share a bit of background and the story of the fund? Yeah, for sure. Well, thanks so much for having me on. Excited to be here. Um, happy to go back kind of, I don't know how far you want me to go. As I was, far as you I want. Was, <laughs> yeah, so I was born in London, um, grew up in the south of Spain, um, spent most of my summers, despite the good climate and, and weather, indoors, on online games, kind of a lot of forums, things like that. Um, so it was very much like an early sort of tech adopter on that on that basis. Always had like a bit of a weird obsession. So then fast forwarding a few a few years, um, went to uni at Exeter, studied flexible combined honours, which is a bit of a mixed degree. Uh, it suited my sort of generalist style, I think, doing a bit of uh, criminology, sociology through to Spanish and English, um, multiple things like that. Um, and then realised at the moment when I was kind of going to graduate, I'd spent my last few sort of summers and Christmases intensely trying to get internships and work with cool tech startups, things that I thought were going to, you know, potentially be exciting uh, businesses impacting consumers um, further down the line and so I think that's what really sort of sparked my interest in like working in the startup and tech ecosystem initially. So upon graduating I went and worked for a crypto fintech in London. Um, crypto was still, I mean it still is nascent but even back then it was um, still on its uh, kind of early innings and yeah, joined that as kind of like one of the early employees, um, stayed with them for about a year. They were focused on like interoperable dApps in the kind of like cross-chain ecosystem, um, but realized maybe not the space I wanted to kind of launch my initial career in, like, because obviously your first few connections in business, I like, stay with you for a while. So then moved into the food media world, um, joined a company called Mob, where I helped launch their um, subreddit, uh, looked heavily at like kind of cross-growth opportunities from you know, multiple subreddits and other digital communities um, and wanted to help them diversify channels. So that was a really, really exciting kind of um, story to be part of. I think they were one of the first sort of creative businesses in the UK um, and still kind of left myself wanting to do more. I think that generalist sort of muscle came back and I was like, staying with one company is great, but what if you could work with multiple? And that's kind of where I, I fell into the, in the world of VC. So yeah, I joined Concept back in um, October 2019 as the first employee. We were formerly known as RFC Ventures. Um, and yeah, it's been an incredible journey since. So just for a little bit of background on the fund, um, we're 54 million pound pre-seed dedicated vehicle. So we are mainly focused at, you know, two people in a pitch deck stage of investing. So looking heavily on kind of founder domain expertise or founder market fit, that's what gets us really excited. Um, but also then helping them to work through that kind of like first 12 to 18 months of their business um, and help them kind of get set up for success going forward. So that's really been what I've spent a lot of time thinking about and doing for the last three and a half years. And uh, we're, you know, hugely privileged to be in this position and got an amazing team doing it. And uh, first few cohorts of founders are doing pretty well, but um, obviously always kind of uh, keen to learn and, and do more and, you know, expand our investment horizons, look at other sectors, etc. A lot to unpack, um, yeah. but I guess from your experience uh, in crypto, fintech and community, uh, how much of that do you apply on your day to day for actually you know, looking for companies or uh, yeah. founders? It's a good question. I think around actual like practical implementation, less so. I think I, I focus a lot on like post investment support as well. So look after our founders once we've invested, look at the onboarding workshops, how we can support them with their kind of core KPIs. Um, but with the actual sector expertise, I think relatively little. Um, I think having like a beginner's mindset to most things really helps. Um, I've done stuff in insure tech, in fintech, which is obviously where I spent a bit more time early on, but a lot now in mobile games, games infrastructure, AI, as I'm sure everyone's uh, talking about at the moment, but also now B2B marketplaces. I think being able to have like prolonged exposure to sectors has kind of like flywheel benefits and you know compounding effects which we can talk about in a bit um, when it comes to kind of sourcing and supporting but yeah I think actually not trying to build too much of a um, niche or uh, area that I spent too much time in has actually been 
more useful in my career today. Yeah. So in, in short, probably not that much of my background do I actually use day to day. And, and is it because when it comes to investing, um, the next big thing is always changing and that's why you don't want to specialise? Is that why you haven't? A little bit, yeah. I also think owing to the stage we invest at, um, you have no idea what's going to walk through the door. Like we were looking at business in like the architecture space through to, you know, climate. And I think if you are too narrowly focused, you need to, you, you know, you're putting yourself at risk of kind of like not seeing enough opportunities. And I think as well, when you look at like the most successful investors out there at the true early stage, you've got Y Combinator, 500 startups and kind of a few others in that, in that category. Um, diversification and large portfolios is really what um, they're very much respecting. So like the power laws of venture where one or two outlier um, investments will kind of really factor in the lion's share of the returns. So that's sort of what we've been trying to construct the fund around and that naturally will lead to like more diversification of verticals as well. So we try not to go too niche. Interesting. I mean, I, I know, uh, yeah, Y Combinator, they've got hundreds of companies every year, but yeah. Uh, Fifty percent of them are in AI. So, do, do you still sort of index based on general themes, or? Yeah, I think like we look, when we look back on kind of like our annual LP or biannual LP reports, like we had to report on the diversification with both sectors and kind of like team, etc. Um, but I think with like the YC case, that's very much like trends driven. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, yes, naturally, like the top of funnel has been pretty full with AI stuff at the moment, but it's a scary space to be investing in right now, to be honest. There's a lot of uh, uncertainty as to how like the landscape's going to kind of play out. Where does the value accrue? Um, what sort of businesses should we really be like getting excited about? I don't think anyone's got like, that sort of an answer right now. So I'd be pretty wary of people who are kind of over indexing uh, at this stage, or at least, yeah, that's what we think. Interesting take, hot take. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, I guess a company or a founder considering uh, concept ventures, um, what they should, what should they know about you to sort of auto qualify themselves, and then how do you qualify and, and make decisions? Yeah. Uh, so as I mentioned, like it's very much like the first twelve to eighteen months of the company life cycle. So usually, it, you know, it's very soon after incorporation or like leaving a full time role. Sometimes we speak to people who are still in an active role, but generally we cap our the kind of rounds that we want to participate in at um, one and a half million pounds at the very upper end. Um, we see stuff as small as 300k, 500k, a million. Um, all of that's kind of very much fair game. Um, but what we want to see is sort of UK and UK adjacent businesses raising up to one and a half million pounds. And um, I think you know it's very much as I said on the founder and the and the ambitions of the people behind the business. So. That's where we spend a lot of uh, our own process um, kind of digging into and focusing on. Now, what our process looks like is kind of clearly outlined on our website, but we do have four main steps. Um, first meeting with kind of like me or one of my colleagues or on the junior team. Uh, second meeting, we often like dig in a little bit deeper to competitive landscape, like async communication with the founder generally on a few like key points that we want to get clarity on before moving forward. Then a third, step is usually like bringing one of the partners um getting like a partnership view on it and then the fourth is an ic or an investment committee so it can happen in like a week and a half if we do it, are forced to move very quickly but i think as you probably experience with angels and other other investors on, on your cap table it's um like a very people-centric uh investment style and i think if you're made to make decisions too quickly um, it doesn't really sit right when these are kind of 10 year relationships. So we, whilst we want to move quickly and keep up with the market, we also want to um, be respectful of the relationships we're building with founders. Yeah, I know that there's a lot of, I mean, I know a lot of it comes from the US and YC around creating a bit of FOMO so that you yeah. can get the investors over the line more quickly. But um, I, I understand, you know, you're ultimately it, it's a, it's a long-term relationship and mm. uh, you don't want to be getting in for the wrong reasons because um, that then just creates disalignment and surprises because once, once you're actually invested, um, then, you know, yeah. what if happens? If, cutting yeah. work, it's not, yeah. good, it's not good for anyone. Yeah. And I also think, you know, we as a firm have tried to look in maybe slightly different areas. So our largest backer is the British Business Bank or the British government they have um, a mandate where they want to kind of like 
invest in more regionally focused businesses and kind of plug that gap at pre seed that we've identified and felt as a firm. Um, we really see that like looking where other funds aren't is an actual differentiator. If you're able to build conviction in a team and opportunity that isn't also being thrown kind of six term sheets at the same time, um, that actually lets you kind of feel you get a better chance to understand the business, what their kind of key challenges are going to be over the next 12 to 18 month period um, and be more helpful and thoughtful with like round construction and everything else at, at the moment of investment. So so how often do you leave London to meet? <laughs> yeah, a fair bit, a fair yeah? bit, yeah. And, um, and, and beyond like Oxford and Cambridge? How much to Brighton? Well, we, we, uh, yeah. we, an unannounced investment is headquartered up in Edinburgh. Okay. Um, We've been looking kind of in Northern Ireland for a bit. We haven't like pulled the trigger on any companies yet, but yeah, we're very open to, and, and think that there's amazing talent actually across the Southwest as well. We've seen, we've backed two companies in Bristol, uh, about to back a third. So yeah, I think it's uh, a long-term game, yeah. ultimately venture. Like yeah. we're year one of a 10 year fun life cycle. And I think the fact we've, already been able to move outside of London has been great um, but there's always more work still. No the congrats because I was at a, uh, a Tech Nation panel oh, yeah. with investors and the whole theme was in investing outside of London okay. and uh, one of the investors said to a, a founder based outside of London just moved to London <laughs> and, and and then all the founders sort of I mean it was it was a you know wonderful to watch <laughs> But, uh, <laughs> but, you know, I think that the reality is, is that the, the investors on the panel hadn't made any investments outside of London. Um, and so I, I guess it's great that you're already doing that. Yeah, I think in like a post COVID world as well, people should have more like flexibility with their own like mindsets. And yes, London is where it's you know, a melting pot of talent yeah. opportunity, obviously. But at the same time, it's often like repeat entrepreneurs, people who've you know, made some money, had a lot of learnings, have a great network, and they don't actually need to be in the city 24-7 and have a little bit more time to kind of relax and um, step back from, like, the fr frantic nature of it all. And uh, as well as, like, we've got a company called Condense down in Bristol, and they have, like, kind of unrivaled access to top talent coming out of that whole region. And there are the kind of competitive advantages that come with it too. So, yeah, I, I definitely don't think... Um, it has to be London or 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 nothing. Yeah, that's great. And I guess going back to you know you, um, you know what was what's been your favourite moment since since being with Concept? Yeah, there's been many. I mean, it's been a really really amazing journey. Um, started as I mentioned back in late 2019, we were running an SEIS and EIS fund. So that's kind of like a tax scheme in the UK. There's certain funds that can roll up investors and act as a fund on, on their behalf. Um, and we did that for a few years whilst we sort of built a track record and tried to like plug that institutional gap. Um, over that time, we like worked with some amazing companies and founders and, you know, built those really strong relationships and learned a lot from them had some that have been incredibly successful, some that haven't, and learned a lot throughout that process, which you kind of constantly like been very keen and, and aware to like feed back into the engine and, and the company's growth. Um, I think the the biggest, like most exciting one for me is like when you see a, co a company like really become very real, like ultimately you meet two people who are usually a little bit weirdly obsessed with a problem and then you kind of see them like, not that we don't speak for six months, but you catch up, come to their offices six months later, and they're suddenly, like, a team of ten, and you really kind of start to feel a company coming into into existence. So I think seeing that over the years has been really, really rewarding. Um, obviously, like, fundraising milestones are great, but um, seeing an incredible product uh, out in the market as well. Uh, a business called Eleven Labs we've invested in. It was, you know, very much like MVP prototype, and now, you know, they're one of the leading companies in the AI revolution right now. So it's amazing to see sort of that happen in front of your eyes over like what feels like a massive, massive sort of shift in uh, the like modern tech narrative. So being part of that is awesome. Right. But yeah, I think the final thing to say is just, it's a massive privilege to work with companies who are, you know, going on these crazy ambitious journeys and trajectories and play a very small part in that. Um, that's been 
time and time again my favorite part of the job well, i guess it must be quite rewarding to because you're investing so early you have probably invest pre-trends and i guess yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, we're, we're see, not thematic of yeah. that, but we sometimes yeah, yeah. happen to be yeah yeah it must be really rewarding and um what's what do you wish you'd known before joining concept yeah that's... or becoming an investor yeah yeah i still don't it's obviously like a I think every month you draw like a new insight, try not to do too much kind of pattern matching. I think one of the things that uh, would have been nice to like really learn like sooner was like it, in our view at least, and we see that like this is one of the common like internal narratives of like all about the team and all about the people. And I think over time you can get, think this is the next best idea and like it's a space or market you know pretty well and you think there's like rock solid foundations everything they're articulating and and telling you about the world seems to be very true but ultimately like if the team aren't right or they've kind of overlooked uh kind of one of their core weaknesses in the founding team ultimately they're not not going to be having a very easy time with that and i think that's kind of one of the central things we keep coming back to um we've looked at kind of the solo founder versus co-founder risk our, our data says it's tough on the co-founders and, and the solo founder side um but obviously there's always like outliers and people who prove us wrong consistently so again it's about not being too rigid with our mindsets and just being open to new data points and new new uh yeah perspectives yeah i'm, I'm a solo founder so i've, yeah. I've often had the, <laughs> the, the the questions and i guess i i there's a stat i don't know if it's true but i think 60 percent of startups fail because of co-founder mm. issues so i guess it, it's it's something to you know balance as well yeah it's a really i mean that's what we we are always trying to like see around the corner on um when we are meeting early teams like have they worked together before have they got experience with conflict yeah. resolution all of these things and yeah i mean you can't regardless of how much time you spend prior to investing you it's really really tough to try and like mitigate or, or understand um too early on like we only get whatever a few hours a lunch an afternoon like you can't really yeah. spend for a long period of time so yeah i think it swings both ways um time will reveal all i guess on yeah <laughs> and i guess um you know what what sort of red flags have you sort of picked up on um yeah just generally across all the companies i mean i i guess obviously it's not necessary to say oh this is a bad company but mm. i guess for for founders listening what should they be looking out for mm. N not necessarily because they're looking to raise funding but because it, it might impact their growth potential yeah i think maybe if i do talk through the, like the funding lens because obviously we see a lot we got a lot of cold outreach we got a lot of people kind of pitching through network etc and i think ultimately talking about the team again, but like, why specifically you? Why have you got an unfair advantage or a unique perspective? Why are you gonna kind of tell us something we didn't know or the world didn't know or your kind of ICP customers? What are they gonna kind of find out from you and your products and vision of the world that they didn't already know? And I think too often that's not clear from things I see. And you can have a 25 page pitch deck with incredible market analysis and graphs and data points and McKinsey reports, but ultimately like if you can distill that into one sentence or paragraph that's what gets us excited and want to get on a call and i think that's you know if people are often starting a startup for the sake of starting a company um that's also quite obvious through that mm -hmm. sort of lens of being that way um so we definitely press people on kind of why them why this team um and it, you know it doesn't always have to be perfectly uh, articulated and often it's people from outside of an industry who can completely rethink it and reinvent it but yeah I think it's a it's a good kind of way of thinking or framing to go into conversations there the other th kind of main thing is understanding that like founders do hold a lot of the cards when it comes to momentum and um, building sort of either a fundraiser or even like the very early foundations of a company mm -hmm. and one of the things that we and I know a lot of later stage investors look for as well is sort of momentum and pace of execution. And I think there's a, a number of times I can think of a founder who we've kind of like said, no, it's a little bit earlier, we don't have the data points, but they've showed consistently like showing up, sending kind of reports, showing what they're doing, what they're building, what traction they're having. It doesn't have to be revenue even, but just being able to communicate that and 
that's just showing up. I don't think enough people even managed to do that. So that's like a really good early barometer in absence of kind of data for us. Yeah, no, I think, uh, well, investor relations, whether they're your current investors or not, is, is super important because yeah. ultimately it helps engage and that brings them on the journey. Um, but as a founder, I, I, it's, it's not easy to, to report because, um, you know, there's always the fear that actually momentum will slow down and sometimes yeah. it does slow down, but then it's like, how do you make sure that, um, you know, it doesn't spook your investors? Um, ultimately, if, if they're good investors, they, they'll, they'll understand and yeah. work with you to get back on track. But um, yeah, no, that's very fair. And that's, again, comes back to the like trust and working relationship thing, right? Like if you're pushed and crammed into these very accelerated timelines, they're going to have um, you know, the, the VCs won't understand your company well enough. People are going to kind of struggle to really be as helpful as they can be. And yeah, in the absence of that trust, you will maybe try and hard, hide yeah. the, the kind of hard times. Like bad information or like negative news is always going to be like relatively hard to get out of a company. You've got to sort of call them up and dig in through yeah. conversations to get it out if you haven't got that relationship and openness. But if somebody comes and they say, hey, look, We've had this issue, it was two days ago, it might be like an employee's equity or a big customer churning, whatever. But this is what we think we need to do. Can we just soundboard it? Can we talk through? Like all of these are much more productive and you know healthy ways to, to deal with that. And that's kind of you know something we're really learning and trying to build into our own like support with our, our companies. Yeah, well, good luck. I mean, yeah, it's uh, it's it's tough. Building startups is tough, but if oh, you yeah. can count on your investors as a sounding board, then that that's that's great. Yeah, no, that's true. I think we've the reporting component is like interesting. Like we all have, we're a team of seven now, um, and we have um, individual relationship kind of leads on on deals. So like, if you were to kind of source a company and lead it through end to end and then like manage that relationship, then obviously it's your job to extract the information, keep the team open and, and abreast to kind of the latest happenings of the company. So yeah, like we're, we're equally responsible as kind of the founders to work with them and, and bring that back to our, to our team. And we think that's quite a good way of, of doing it. So, so how often, you know, what, what does a healthy, relationship with a family like in terms of check-ins is it every week every two weeks every month yeah that's um actually something we have like a bit of a fluid view on um we think like no founder and no company at the same you could be a third time exit entrepreneur or you could be a first time founder with no work experience coming straight out of uni those are very different profiles and those people need very different things from early stage investors and if you're the kind of experienced repeat entrepreneur you often want a bit of capital and accountability um, and maybe some market insights like hearing stuff through the industry about competitors trends etc and those are relatively you know we sometimes just have like a quarterly catch-up and monthly or like we have whatsapp groups with all of our founders so we'll you know talk on a weekly basis with most but structured catch-ups we're probably more likely to see that with kind of first time uh, founders and they often want that they want to talk through decisions talk through you know, the journey as they progress. And I think that's really nice balance we've found. I think there's no one size fits all approach to this stuff. And anyone who's trying to do that, um, yeah, it's maybe not gonna be that successful. But I also think at the other end of the spectrum, you've got the large, very large funds, a huge platforms and resource to, to be, you know, hand holding and helping founders. And that's awesome too, but it's just not what we have and what we are. So I think we definitely lean towards the, um, yeah, take it case by case. Yeah, well, I think WhatsApp groups are super valuable. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, they're great. I mean, <laughs> end up pinging people over the weekend and, you know, everyone's just like one call away. It's so much easier than than uh, emails. Everyone gets enough of those. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And um, I guess you mentioned you're in the first year of a 10-year fund. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned, you know, obviously, investing outside of London, um, but sort of what's the vision for the next 10 years then? So we want to be the number one pre-seed option for founders uh, in Europe. That's kind of our 10-year ten, ten vision. Um, we know that like repeat reps at that stage, seeing kind of multiple companies in multiple sectors going through that journey, there's going to be a lot of like parallels and similarities. Like obviously we'll already see that. Um, and we think we can be, you know, the best platform 
and um, option for founders there. Like, be that, you know, collaborative if you want to build a kind of solid first round or you just want us in and want to then go and find a specialist at seed or whatever. That we, we can see a number of um, routes to getting there. Um, how exactly that's going to play out, we don't know yet, but we have a very clarified vision on like what the next two funds look like, for example, where we are going to be investing out of this vehicle for the next three years and then um, leaving kind of follow on beyond that. And then, yeah, raising and deploying from two new funds after that. So it's fairly well charted. Um, we have a lot of work ahead as always. Um, but yeah, it's super exciting. Like, as you know, I've been on the journey for the last three years. Not that it is building a startup yourself, but I think when you are like the first person in um, outside the GPs, it's a really, really kind of rewarding um, journey to go on. And with all those kind of founders I'm working with now, it's been been amazing. Across your portfolio of companies, you know, what is the, the maybe a one or two pain points that they all sort of encounter? Yeah, I mean, that's that's so varied. Um, but I think there are similarities. Like many, many people have kind of lack of access to talent or need great full stack engineers, whatever it may be. And the way we kind of view that is like that's not really necessarily our role. We want to try and help where we can on that, but very much down to founders to motivate incredible people to join their business. So yeah, that one's just like across the board uh, at table stakes, I say, unless you meet a team who are literally like got all of their first seven hires lined up, whatever. Um, I think one of the things that's tough for any founder, regardless of experience, regardless of industry, but going from, as I said, like two people with a great idea for the world to suddenly like something more is transitioning as like an individual. Um, we're very focused on the people, as I mentioned, and like, but also like, the psychology and the deep rooted like strengths and weaknesses behind everybody. And I think that's, something that not necessarily that people have got wrong, but like, I think everyone needs to be aware of and uh, kind of react to. Because if you're suddenly waking up and you're like 15 people, 30 people, and you know there's a lot of softer stuff around culture, around onboarding, around you know scaling and planning for the future, I think all of that stuff maybe does go unnoticed. So the relentless focus on kind of metrics or fundraising and some of these other, other milestones. Um, so I think that's something we always try and like talk to our founders about and try and give our input and thoughts because we've you know built our own culture over time too. So I have some good good viewpoints on that. I was hoping you say legal or uh, yeah. <laughs> or finance. Yeah, you, but... you did team me up with that one. I completely missed it. But no, I guess yeah, talent is is, is key and. Um... But it's one of those things where you need to hire quickly to also be able to deliver on your plans. Yeah. But but it's also something where if you rush it, then it can also backfire. And yeah, it's very much like a balancing act from what we've seen. Like hire slow, fire fast, as the as yeah. it goes. Um, but often, yeah, I mean, you you just can't, you just can't push some of these things, and it always takes longer than we think from experience. They're like, oh, here's the cash flow forecast and the budget forecast and you can see we've got like three engineers starting in a month and then in reality it's actually a bit longer than that by the time they're yeah. onboarded and up to speed in notice periods so yeah yeah i think just being able to help founders like be aware of those limitations and i think you do mention on the legal side um it, it, unless you've raised funds before it's quite a confusing sort of landscape um and process to go through so we try and like actually be really transparent we've got our term sheet on our website we really want to get offer like very impartial advice to founders on you know how to run a fundraise how to you know especially when they're going and raising subsequent rounds but even at the moment that we are investing we want to be like very open about um terms and the implications for their business because i think that's uh, you know something that's quite daunting and unless you are a repeat fan you probably haven't gone through before yeah uh, well it's great that you publish a term sheet um because I think uh, it, as a founder, it's difficult to know what standard and um, at least by putting it out there, it, it helps them do their homework. Yeah, we tried to make it as vanilla as possible over the years, but inevitably every time there's something that people want to change or tinker. Yeah. But it's, um, yeah, look, I, I think it's completely mental at our stage to be trying to yeah. put in anything too funky or restrictive. Um, ultimately, it's that pre seed stage is a lot about like hypothesis testing and you know, we factored in that a lot of people are not going to um, always have the 
crazy fun return of story. That's yeah, just like yeah. the reality of, of, of adventure uh, and startups more broadly. So I think, yeah, just having a bit more like plain, lightweight um, legals is in everyone's interest. Great. And um, in terms of, you know, going back to, you know, growth, um, you mentioned growing the, the subreddit um, yeah. to over 80,000. Yeah, yeah. So Reddit is, I mean, as you know, I love SEO and um, yeah. we've had a lot of success there. Um, we've recently been looking more at social media as a way of, mm -hmm. um, you know, creating our own audience and, 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 and all of that. But Reddit is an area where I'd love to learn more. So um, how do you get started? And, and what do you do to grow your Reddit community? Yeah, I think it's still like the best and purest social media platform out there. I think Twitter gives it a good run, but um, we'll see like with the recent must changes how that all all plays out. Um, but yeah, I think it's a really incredible like vertical segmentation of interests, and so you can find such like strong and passionate users. So when we're going back to the mob stuff, when we were working with them, they were are producing a lot of content for Instagram, Facebook, um, and Ben, the founder, wanted to look at how they could access Reddit as a new channel um, because of just how like interested and engaged each of the users were. Uh, I think like now there's a bit like diminishing returns of TikTok, Instagram, and all these things. The audience is never really yours. You can't have that much of a um, bi-directional interaction. So I think Reddit was really, really amazing for that. And uh, a lot of it is looking for what communities already exist because usually with a platform like that as like the tool that it is um, people will naturally create and organize themselves into sort of communities little packages and they can be really really broad like television and they can be very very niche like i don't know succession to go down within a specific example um, and what we saw is like the idea of growth hacking could work quite well there so posting content through to a broader group so in this case it was gift recipes somewhere where people were sharing like cooking videos and content and putting in like very lightly branded and um, uh, yeah stuff that was cross posted through from our own community and slowly kind of drip fed people back through and did that over enough time added in engagement around like giveaways um, suggestions on recipes but actually what we realized over time is like it was incredibly useful for um, feedback on like what sort of content would be successful, what sort of content they want to see more of, because I think on Instagram and places like that is very much like, yeah, this looks great, tag my mate. And it's not very, um, yeah, like descriptive, it's very sort of social in, in, it, in its um, nature. So Reddit's incredible for that, like people who like and know what they're talking about to give their thoughts, often giving too much of their own opinion on things. but. Yeah, I think it's uh, an amazing channel and something people should be looking at. We're in the process of trying to explore a early stage UK ecosystem and um, we're launching something called Fund Finder, which is helping founders in the UK to access, um, if concept aren't a fit, um, uh, a number of other uh, UK active investors. And we're going to be launching that probably later this month. And we wanted to, off the back of it, surface a lot of resources around kind of questions you should ask VCs as a founder, but also, you know, what's to have in your data room, how to prepare your kind of like pitch deck and ancillary documents. Um, and with that, we wanted to kind of launch somewhere where people are going to come meet other founders, connect, speak to the concept team if they need, ideally not pitch and talk through investment ideas, but more like general advice. And so that's something we're kind of thinking hard about. And whether that takes the form of a subreddit, probably not. Slack, uh, I don't know if people have enough Slack communities, but we're going to come up with something soon uh, and hopefully get it out in the world. Great. No, so I guess uh, back to the Reddit, it's create a community, find bigger communities that are relevant, cross post. More generic, generous. Uh, and then engage um, to create a bit of traction. And then, um, yeah, but the, your, your founder community is really useful um, because I, I think as, as a founder, um, it is good to meet other founders and often the best place to meet other founders is for investors and yeah um, to, I think yeah. so I mean yeah. it's whether the it's whether founders want to meet specific founders funding yeah. founders other legal tech founders whatever it may be or is it kind of just anybody out there and I, I think 
the idea of like surfacing and sharing information is a really powerful one and I think with having to give up your evenings and go to like specific hosted events or drinks or networking things it's not always like the best format so to have something more like drop in drop yeah. out um easy accessible could be really great but yeah it's still in uh ideation phase so well, good luck don't expect anything soon <laughs> well I, i'll expect the notification yeah yeah exactly it'd be great to have you yeah yeah love to and um conscious of taking a lot of your time so i'm gonna ask you the closing question we ask all our guests so um you're on the tech story podcast so what's your favorite software or hardware tech product? Ooh. Well, we were talking about Whoop before we came in um, on the hardware side. I do love my yeah, analytics, sleep data, all of that <laughs> lovely yeah. stuff. Um, I love mine too. <laughs> yeah, we need to, I need to get you as a friend on there. Oh. We compete on the uh, social media. Oh, feature. yeah. When it comes to software, that is a very good question. I mean, actually, looking back on like usage, there's an app called Zero for intermittent. Actually, that's the most VC cliche thing ever, but I do love intermittent fasting. Like, just really helps me to a not get fat, but also b to keep my brain pretty engaged and focused in the mornings. And they've got a really simple like time track. I think it's a New York based company. I don't even know how they monitor. Well, I've seen a bit of monetization. I haven't converted, but it's a nice, simple product which I think simplicity is genius sometimes. So that's pretty good. Um, outside of like obviously the Apple suite because I love all of that stuff. Um, but yeah, any other ones you want me to go into? No, I mean, <laughs> I haven't heard of zero. So I'll, I mean, I, I guess I skip breakfast. I don't know if that counts as Probably does. Fasting. Yeah. It's just a, re <laughs> a rebrand for skipping breakfast. Yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I really like the Whoop. Um, not, not that I'm a, you know, fitness to dick, but I, I quite like it when I know that I don't need to feel bad about not working out because I've already worked out. Yeah, no, that's true. That's yeah. true. Uh, and what's your favorite? Um, I mean, I, I like superhuman um, mm. just because if I can't do something, I can set a reminder and that way everything always gets done. Yeah. Um, I I like recently I've been playing a lot with Zapier. Okay. Nice. Um and I've been using OpenAI's Zapier connection to yeah. process data from other apps and then make decisions based on it. Oh cool. Um so that I can then also like do various things. Um so that's okay. that's been quite fun. But final one on that. I've yeah. been playing around with Glide, which is like a uh, front end for Airtable. You can basically plug oh, okay. it into anything, Google Sheets, Airtable, yeah. but like a no code app builder. Okay. Uh, and have built all of our like portfolio management tools inside of that. And you can like just spend hours and hours on that. Yeah. Thing. It's so fun and so powerful. And we have like GPT summarizers now, as you said, yeah, to yeah. process monthly reports, extract data, yeah, all yeah. that stuff. So yeah, that's been really fun. Yeah, doing a uh, bit more like building stuff. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll have a look at Glide. But um, yeah, well, thank you very much for being on the show. Thanks for having me. And um, yeah, best of luck with concept and, and finding all the British unicorns outside of London. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, send them our yeah. way. Um, yeah. And yeah, love to meet as many of you out there.